continue, please be ready to pledge financial support when you are asked later in the program. Perhaps one of the most remarkable events of the past several years was the meeting at Assisi, Italy of some 130 leaders of Christian as well as non-Christian religions. Buddhists, animists, Shintoists, Muslims, and many others were the guests of John Paul II, who had invited them to come to Assisi on October 27, 1986, for a World Day of Prayer. The most serious sacrilege took place at the Church of St. Peter, where the Dalai Lama, who was considered to be semi-divine, and his disciples placed a statue of Buddha on the tabernacle. I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. Some have said that John Paul II was tricked into participating at Assisi, or that he very much later regretted that Assisi ever took place. However, here is what he said on December 22nd, 1986, two months after Assisi. Quote, that event, the Assisi meeting, appears to me to be of so grand a scope that of itself it invites us to profound reflection. It is plain that we ought to be happy with it and our success in realizing it, unquote. With me to discuss Assisi are two priests who remain faithful to the traditions of the Catholic Church and who celebrate the traditional Latin Mass exclusively. <coughs> Father Clarence Kelly, spiritual director of St. Joseph's Novitiate, a congregation of traditional Catholic sisters, and Father William Jenkins, pastor of St. Therese of the Child Jesus Church in Parma, Ohio. Reverend Fathers, I understand that around the turn of the century, say 1893 in Chicago and 1900, in Paris, there were attempts to involve Catholics and representatives of the Catholic Church in Assisi-like world congresses of religions. What was the reaction of the reigning pontiff at that time, Pope Leo XIII, to those efforts? The so-called ecumenical movement with which we are familiar today was preceded by a movement called the Pan-Christian Movement, pan meaning all, like pantheism. Uh, and the reaction of the Catholic Church was to, to condemn Catholic participation in such meetings uh, and organizations simply because we believe that Jesus Christ established a church, one church, and that church is the only church in the world that's 2,000 years old, that is the Catholic Church. And therefore, it is necessary for men to enter that church for salvation. If they do not enter the church and they are culpable for their rejection of the grace of God which moves them to enter, they cannot save their souls. Therefore, to have the one true church of Jesus Christ participate on equal footing with false religions, uh, with religions that worship demons, because uh, the scripture says all the gods of the pagans are demons, is an abomination, is an attack upon the truth of, uh, of Jesus Christ and upon the integrity of his church. And therefore, the vicars of Christ, the representatives of Christ, would reject any type of uh, participation. What the church, of course, would allow is the evangelization of non-Catholics to bring them into the the fold. You know, many are very quick to criticize the so-called abuses of Vatican II, but defend the documents of Vatican II and their integrity. However, in connection with the CC, there was one of the documents in Vatican II was Catholic Principles of Ecumenism, and if I may quote very briefly, it says the following. It follows that these separated churches and communities though we believe they suffer from defects already mentioned, have by no means been deprived of significance and importance in the mystery of salvation. Here's the key phrase. For the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as a means of salvation. This, of course, is a heresy. Later on, we see that John Paul II, in his first encyclical, 
said the following. His encyclical of October 79, Catechesi Tridende. It is extremely important to make a correct and loyal presentation of the other churches, which the spirit of Christ does not refuse to use as a means of salvation. A direct quote from Vatican II. Now we see a CC. We see a picture of John Paul II with the different uh, representatives. We see the, the incredible event, if we may see the pictures now, of Dalai Lama and his followers placing the statue of Buddha on the tabernacle. Uh, there's a number of shots here. We see it from the back. Dalai Lama is considered to be semi-divine. He participated in Assisi, and he put a statue of Buddha on the tabernacle in the Church of St. Peter's. This is the first ship, uh, shot. That first one was a view from behind the altar, I believe. This is a view <coughs> also from the side, I would imagine. And it's somewhat difficult to make out the Buddha, but there you can see very clearly this pagan statue upon a tabernacle. And for us Catholics, the tabernacle is the Holy of Holies in which dwells Almighty God, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And a statue of a pagan god or a representative of a pagan religion to be put on top of that would be like, in the Old Testament, putting a statue of Baal on top of the Holy of Holies. That's right. Would you say that it's accurate to say then that Assisi is a, a, a representation of Vatican II? It's a consequence of Vatican II. I think it's a logical expression of the betrayal of the church by the Council Fathers. Mm -hmm. The Council Fathers did in actuality what might be expressed symbolically in the re-crucifixion of Christ. If they could get a hold of our Lord Jesus Christ and drive nails through his hands and feet again and put a crown of thorns upon his head and uh, scourge him at the pillar and mock him and shake their fist in his face and drive a spear into his side, that is the equivalent of what they have done by this betrayal. In many ways, this betrayal is, is worse in the sense that the effect of it will surely be the damnation of countless millions of souls. You know, Father Kelly, in, in conversations you've mentioned that as shocking as the CC is, as shocking as Buddha on the tabernacle is, I mean, many people wouldn't believe this unless they actually saw these pictures. You say to me that this is quite mild in comparison with what, what is taking place in the church around the world today. Well, it's quite mild in the sense that here you see this uh, statue on top of a tabernacle and an ecumenical meeting at which people shake hands and smile. But if you go into the seminaries and you study what they're teaching, you see in a very explicit way the rejection of the Catholic religion that is symbolized by this event at Assisi. For example, I believe I may have mentioned some of these things to you before. When I was in a seminary at Immaculate Conception Seminary in Huntington, New York, we were taught explicitly that Jesus Christ did not die an atoning death for our sins. We were taught that there's no such thing as objective morality, uh, that uh, uh, it is a laughable thing to believe that the bread and wine are changed actually into the body and blood of Christ. The, the things that are being taught, for example, at Catholic University, professors teaching that homosexuality is an acceptable form of life, divorce, uh, abortion, uh, and so forth and so on. There's even a priest traveling around the country named Father Fox, a Dominican, uh, heaven forbid, who has on his staff a witch. He, he teaches, or used to teach, at the College of the Holy Names of Jesus and Mary. And he, he's supposed to be a serious professor of theology. He had a witch, an actual practicing witch. Uh, and she was on the staff as a witch. It wasn't as if she was teaching mathematics and happened mm -hmm. to be a witch. She was on the staff as a witch. You know, this, this of course raises a very important question which is increasingly coming before the public. Namely, someone ultimately bears responsibility for this. I mean, many people try to protect John Paul II as they say he was ignorant of Assisi. But yet we have another picture where John Paul II was marked with the sign of the adorers of Shiva at Bombay. Now, Shiva is the uh, Hindu goddess of destruction. And all one has to think about is the, the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have any strange gods before me. Or another occasion in the Solomon Islands, 
we see that John Paul II participated in what is called dotting the eyes of the lion. This lion has the so-called power to ward off evil after its lion, its eyes are dotted. I mean, he's doing this. What, what does this raise regarding to the, his claims on the papacy? How can, what, what does this tell us, these kind of activities? Well, he's certainly giving grave scandal. And the only possible interpretation of his actions is that, uh, that he sees that all religions contain elements of the divine, <clears throat> and uh, it would cast doubt, certainly, on his own faith. You know, one day he will speak in glowing terms of the Rosary and the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Blessed Sacrament. The next day he'll talk about the glories of Shinto or Buddhism. Uh, he also uh, bowed to receive the blessing of snake worshippers in New Guinea at one point. And he was bowing not merely before these snake worshippers, he was bowing before the world. And this is a terrible scandal. And there are people who ask, uh, if talking about these things doesn't give scandal, and even raising the question about the integrity of his own faith, people say, well, doesn't that give scandal? Well, the question is, who is giving the scandal here? Is, are we giving scandal by talking about what he's doing, or is he rather giving scandal by doing these things? Uh, the message to the Catholic people is very clear, and that message is that uh, it really doesn't matter what you believe. All religions are a means of salvation. And uh, God's grace works through all religions, and you can save your, your soul in any one of them. That is a scandal. It is a blasphemy. It is heresy. And, uh, and it is inconceivable that it could be coming from the mouth of a Catholic pope. Father Kelly, can one who apparently does not have the faith be a pope? In order to be the vicar of Jesus Christ, you must be a member of the Catholic Church. It is impossible to be the vicar of Christ, the visible head of the church, without being a member of the church. It is impossible for a heretic to be a member of the Catholic Church. That is to say, someone who embraces uh, a teaching or even calls into question, let's say, someone who embraces a false teaching or calls into question a truth of divine and Catholic faith, it's impossible for such a person to be a member of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, it is possible to be a heretic not only by the saying of words, but also by the giving of example. You can commit an heretical act without speaking one word. The question is, these things that he is doing, can these things be reconciled with someone who believes that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God, that there is only one God, that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of mankind. There is no other Savior. There is no other name by which we can be saved. There is no other possible way that the slightest sin can be forgiven except through Jesus Christ. And it is the teaching of Jesus Christ that you must enter his church to be saved. Now the question is, is it possible to reconcile what he is doing with these teachings of the Roman Catholic Church? To me, it seems impossible. St. Paul, uh, writing to the Corinthians, says, Know you not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? But if any man violate the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which you are. Now, St. Paul is talking about the human body as the temple of God. And uh, the temple of God is also the true church of Jesus Christ, the mystical body of Christ. And he is in the process of bringing disrepute upon the papacy. See, we believe in the papacy. We are Catholics. We believe all the teachings of the Catholic Church. We believe that our Lord Jesus Christ appointed Peter to be his vicar on earth. And we believe that the truth has been preserved precisely because from the time of Christ up until modern times, we have had these vicars of Christ these representatives of Christ, these ambassadors of Christ. It is because what we see him doing to be in conflict with what the popes have taught, that there is a major problem here. So we do not point these things out because we raise a question about the papacy. God forbid that we should do that. That is an intrinsic part of the Constitution of the Church. We raise a question because what he is doing is bringing disrepute 
upon the papacy. What he is doing would have been condemned in no uncertain terms by his predecessors. Therefore, what he is doing cannot be reconciled with what his predecessors have done in the past. You're watching what Catholics and Fathers is, is this. I mean, we, we see this situation where we have, where, where we have a, a, a person who, in all probability, is not a legitimate pontiff. How could God permit something like this? How could he leave, uh, leave a situation where the person who is reputedly his representative is dotting the eyes of the lion, conducting a CC, and not one single person raises a voice in protest over this? How could, what are, have we been abandoned? Why has this occurred? It is clearly a judgment and a punishment of God directed against the members of his true church because of their sins and infidelity. It is an historical fact that the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared at La Salette uh, in France uh, in the 19th century. She appeared again in Lourdes at the beginning of this century and the message was very clear and straightforward. She came as a kind of prophet of the New Testament. She said her divine son is enraged against the sins of the world. He is poised to unleash his justice against the sinful world unless the people stopped sinning and started to live their lives according to their state in life and, uh, and remain faithful to their prayers and avoided the occasions of sin and straightened their lives out. If men refused to do that, then they would be punished. And we are experiencing, in my opinion, that punishment, although I personally believe as well that it's bigger than that too. I personally am of the opinion that we are in the great apostasy spoken of by the Apostle Paul, that we are living in the days which will precede, again in my personal opinion, the coming of the Antichrist. If I, when I look at the situation in the church today, I, I know just from what I was taught in the seminaries, this apostasy from Christianity, this attack upon everything sacred, I, I, I cannot explain it other than by considering it to be this great apostasy, this great falling away, which is spoken of, and which was a necessary prelude to the coming of the Antichrist. Father Jenkins. Julius, uh, perhaps the worst example of this betrayal of Christ by John Paul II has not even appeared on the television screen yet in this program. You know, John Paul II went to the synagogue in Rome, the main synagogue in Rome, and uh, in the course of his visit there, which was a uh, you know, public, very public affair and, uh, and publicized throughout the world, he himself referred to Jesus only two times and never called him Christ. And John Paul II stood there respectfully as though in deep contemplation and uh, recollection while the, uh, the Jewish people sang a song calling for the arrival of the Messiah, which is at least an implicit acknowledgement that the Messiah has not come yet. To refer to our Lord two times by name and never to refer to him as Christ is a terrible scandal. And, uh, and one on that basis alone would have reason to question uh, this man's faith. Uh, certainly, if not his faith, his integrity. If he does believe in Jesus Christ, how he could dissimulate in this way and scandalize these people, some of whom may be, may be of very good will. Uh, that's his brand of ecumenism. And it is, it is abhorrent. It is disgusting. And uh, it's blasphemous and sacrilegious. You know, Pope Pius XI wrote an encyclical called Mortalium Animos against a false Renaissance. Uh, this, this desire to have peace among all religions at any cost. And John Paul II seems to be willing to sweep our Lord under the carpet or lock him in the closet or something to get him out of the way if he presents a problem to anybody. Even his latest encyclical, which is hailed as by the conservative Catholics as a great breakthrough and a, a most Catholic statement, even that is, is ridiculous. It's disgusting. Because over and over again, in the course of that encyclical on the missionary work of the church, he makes no reference whatsoever to the rights of God, 
He says that the church has the right to preach Jesus Christ because of the rights of man. It is a human right to hear about Jesus. This is, this is terrible. It is a betrayal. And to think that conservative Catholics could hail this as a great breakthrough, it shows how bad things really are. You know, my, my only question, one, well, the one question is how this could happen in the first place, but why is it that almost no one has taken a public stand on all these issues? I can think of maybe a handful of bishops who've ever e uttered a peep about this. There's total acceptance and total silence. I can tell you one reason, which I believe is this, that people get the impression that if you point out these things that he has done and characterize them according to their nature, in other words, as abominations, Catholic people get the impression that you are against the Pope, you are against the papacy, that somehow you are undermining or attacking an essential characteristic of the Catholic Church, which we absolutely believe. The papacy was instituted by Jesus Christ. The papacy is a part of the constitution of the Catholic Church, and it will endure until the end of time. When we point out these things, we are not attacking the papacy. When we point out these things, we are coming to the defense of the papacy. We are saying that the vicar of Jesus Christ, acting with his authority, could not promote heretical teaching. That's the point. Uh, that is to say, that's the point as to why people are afraid to direct their attention to this. Because they're afraid people will interpret it as an attack on the papacy. But, as I say, it is not an attack on the papacy. In fact, uh, none of the things that have been done, say from the time of uh, John the 23rd when he called this council, he did not uh, invoke his infallible teaching authority in teaching any of these things. It is also perfectly reconcilable with Catholic doctrine that a reigning pontiff, a true vicar of Jesus Christ, could become a public heretic. And by becoming a public heretic, would sever himself from the church and therefore would, by tacit resignation, lose his position. I would, I would think that pointing this out would actually be a defense of the papacy and that it would probably restore the faith of so many who has been shaken. I know for a fact that after, in the wake of Assisi, many Protestants started pointing their fingers and saying, see, look what the papacy has done. But we're saying the papacy hasn't done that. John Paul II has done that. Uh, you know, Father Jenkins, you mentioned once that there was a very a study by Father Cretino Joly, which was commanded by Gregory the Sixteenth to be published in the <coughs> mid-nineteenth century. It was Pius the Ninth, actually. Pius the Ninth, on the documents of the Alta Vendita, mm -hmm. a secret society, and their goal was to put someone <coughs> into that office of Peter who would who would use it to destroy the church. That's right. Uh, <coughs> back in the eighteen teens. There was a, uh, an uprising in the Papal States, and it was uh, an uprising orchestrated by mercenaries who were brought in to create trouble. And uh, in the course of this, uh, of this attempt, this attempt of a coup to take over the Papal States, uh, the Austrian army came in to put down the coup, and they captured a number of lodges of the Freemason Freemasons. And they captured some documents, and one of the documents has come to be known as the Permanent Instruction of the Alta Vendita. Now, this uh, document was taken very seriously by Pope Pius IX, and he ordered it published. And uh, in this document, the leader of the most secret lodges, which directed all of the other Freemasonic lodges of Italy, uh, gave orders to his followers uh, to infiltrate the convents and the seminaries and the sacristies. Uh, uh, there was a direction to the uh, members of the secret societies, the anti-Catholic secret societies, to gain positions of great influence in the church with the expectation that in the course of time, if they were patient and worked very carefully and slowly, but doggedly, that they would eventually surround the Pope himself and that they would create a Pope who was of their own way of thinking, a very worldly man who could be made to either fear the world or to... to uh, kind of revel in its flattery. And uh, they actually cited the name of a pope who had already lived before as the prime example of the kind of pope they would need again. 
and that was Pope Clement XIV, uh, Ganganelli, uh, the one who suppressed the Jesuits earlier, <laughs> oddly enough. But uh, they really had the confidence that if they worked slowly to infiltrate the church, that they could gain enough influence among the bishops and the cardinals that they could produce a pope who would represent their way of thinking. And then they said, we would control the pope, and the pope will then control the church, and everyone would, everyone would obey the pope, thinking that they were obeying the vicar of Christ, whereas actually they were obeying a revolutionary puppet of the secret societies. The most consoling thought to me in these dark days comes from a doctor and cardinal and saint of the church, St. Robert Bellarmine, who said, Papa hereticus depositus est, meaning a pope who is a heretic, is deposed. What would you tell today's beleaguered Catholics? What can they do about this situation? How can they help in, you know, seeing order restored in the church? What can they do? I think the very first thing that they must do is they must preserve their faith. They must uh, reject this new religion, this new moral teaching, the new doctrine, the new mass, they must reject it as the worship, the morality, and, and the doctrinal teaching of a different religion. They must reject that. And they must adhere to the catechism of their youth, to sound Catholic doctrine, morality, and worship. They must attend the, the true mass. And uh, our Lord, in his own good time, will do what he has to do. Father Jenkins. The most recent issue of the Roman Catholic magazine, by the way, uh, does quote extensively from the permanent instruction of the Ultima Dita. And if people would like to get a copy of that, they would uh, do well to, to let us know. Uh, what Father Kelly is saying is absolutely right. All you have to do is go back and get the catechism. Get the catechism as it was in the 1930s and 1940s. And you know what the Catholic Church taught. Hold to that and reject anything that goes contrary to it. This is what Catholics believe.